morning, everybody. Uh, I was asked to talk about pulling the CO2 back and sort of closing the carbon cycle even in the presence of fossil fuels. But I would like to think about air capture a little more broadly than just that. And I think the last few days have set me up very nicely for that. Uh, in that first, Ken gave a, a talk at the Institute where he pointed out that the carbon really sticks. So the way I tend to think of it is we are building up a carbon debt over time and at least some fraction of that we have to pay back because we are either already in overdraft or we are skidding towards that overdraft right now. And so I would think it's quite likely that over the next 50 to 100 years uh, we will come to the conclusion that we have to pull CO2 back and if that's the case we are talking not about 10 ppm, we are talking on the order of 100 ppm <coughs> and if we are unlucky we come from 550 to 350 and if we are lucky maybe from 450 to, to 350 or 550 <coughs> to 450 and that's 1500 gigatons of CO2 which have to go somewhere. So I would argue as we think about these various options we have, I have always a feeling we tend to over prescribe we should instead create Lego blocks, building blocks we can put in place and say if you have all of these blocks, somehow or another we can put them together and there are various, various options and which we actually will take will depend on very fine balances between costs which we can't possibly predict today. But we need these critical building blocks and if we want to be carbon neutral and go carbon negative, we got to find a place to store the carbon dioxide. Uh, we would like very much to have carbon neutral electricity, but once we give up on gas pickers, it's actually very hard to match demand, whether it's nuclear energy or, or uh, renewable energy. The mismatch between demand and supply comes out differently, but there is a mismatch. So you would very much like to have the ability to soak up excess electricity when you have it and put it into another market. And the one which cries out to do this is the fuels market. So you, you have the ability to transfer and for that, I yesterday argued very, and I think the group is arguing very forcefully, we really do need electrolysis to become very cheap. And that could be water to hydrogen and oxygen. It could also be CO2 and steam to syn gas and oxygen. But we need that option on the table. And then we have one building block in place which doesn't quite exist today because it's far too expensive. The second building block is we need to have the fuel and we now have to ask which one is it. And Nate gave the beautiful talk about the three cycles. You have the hydrogen, you have the carbon cycle, and you have the nitrogen cycle. And I would argue we have expressed a fairly strong preference to the carbon cycle which we run right now open loop. We find reduced carbon, we dump it as CO2 into the atmosphere. And you could say, well, that's because that was there and it's cheap. But we go one step further. We could, in principle, and we have done so, we have shown that we can take coal and natural gas to uh, hydrogen and ammonia. And we are not doing this. We instead burn liquid fuels, which come from petroleum. And we are paying a premium on that liquid petroleum because it nearly is a liquid fuel, which basically negates the cost of transformation of coal into, into liquid, which, by the way, could also be coal into ammonia and coal into hydrogen. So we have expressed a very, very strong preference and so I think it would be very worthwhile to have that. But then you need air capture. Either it's BEX, and you heard all the anguish yesterday, can we really push that to the limit where we would need it? Or are we better off at finding technical means, which some people call direct air capture, uh, of pulling CO2 by chemical means back out of the atmosphere. So the rest of what I have to say in the next 10 minutes or so is about uh, how do we, can we actually make this happen economically? Yeah, because the big gotcha on this particular story is, yeah, sure, you can do that. Uh, every submarine does it. Every spacecraft does it. By the way, every air liquefaction plant in some form or another does it. So because they need to get the sand out of the system, but by, by the time you're liquid, CO2 and water are sand. Right, they're hard solids and you have to get them out before you got there. So they know how to do this, but it's just way too expensive. So how do we can make an argument that it's not? And the first got way of retranslating this gotcha is to say the thermodynamics is going to kill you. You are just very dilute. 
And I think I want to push against that right away. Yes, there is a thermodynamic penalty. Yes, that thermodynamic penalty is larger than taking nitrogen out of the atmosphere by a significant amount, obviously. But the thermodynamic penalty is essentially logarithmic. And so going, going from one atmosphere to 200 atmospheres, which is what you're going to do the liquid nitrogen, is about as costly as going from or 0.7 atmospheres to 200 atmospheres is about as costly as driving the CO2 from 0.04 atmospheres to one atmosphere. So you're roughly doubling your, your economic penalty by doing this. You are roughly two times as expensive in a thermodynamics terms taking CO2 from, let's say, 400 ppm down to 200 ppm in the atmosphere, making one atmosphere CO2 instead of starting with 10, 15% CO2 in a coal plant. There is about a factor two and a two and a half, and if I allow for the fact that the, the coal plant is actually more, is hotter in its flue gas, I can actually argue this is only a factor one and a half. So there is a penalty, but they are small because the thermodynamic energy requirement to take half of the CO2 out of the atmosphere and make, make one atmosphere of pure CO2 is 22 kilojoules per mole. When you burn that stuff to make one mole of CO2, you release 700 kilojoules if you talk gasoline to make this happen. So it is a penalty. It is larger than scrubbing flue gas, but it is not orders of magnitude larger. The second form of this gotcha is a little harder to, so I would argue the thermodynamics we should set aside. It's not the problem. The second gotcha is a little harder. The second gotcha is where Sherwood said, yeah, you know, the separation of anything roughly scales linearly in the dilution. And even the people who argue this way would have to admit that if you look at it, different families of separation have different multipliers in this game. The, 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 co the, the coefficient, the slope in there, varies from material to material. But it's worthwhile looking at one classic example, which is Sherwood brought it up. He said, well, the price of metals is roughly uh, $10 per ton of ore in, 19, it turns out, 1987 dollars. Uh, $10 per ton of ore is the price of the metal. So if you dilute it 10 times more, then the price goes up 10 times more. So I asked myself in 1987 dollars, what can I actually do for $10 a ton of ore? Well, I can crush it and grind, I can dig it up I spent a dollar. I can crush and grind it to a reasonable fineness. I'm talking four or five dollars. I can run one flotation, another couple of dollars, and I can get rid of the tailings. I just spent my ten dollars. So what it really says is what Sherwood really tells you, and I'm quite confident on that point, is what really costs you is the first step. Everything else is in the noise. If you find a counterexample where it's not the first step which costs you money, but the second step, then this is not the problem. Quite clearly, in air capture, we have to see all the air. We are not crushing and grinding it, so I don't think we spend $10 per ton of air on getting to the CO2, and nobody argues we would. But if you now say, well, how, much, how much do I pay to get it off the sorbent? I have completely forgotten about the, the dilution in air. Now it's the dilution on the sorbent which matters except I still have the binding energy of the adsorbent, which remembers the original one. But that's only logarithmic in the concentration. So I found one counterexample to Sherwood, which is very, very glaring, and that's taking uranium out of seawater at three parts per billion. And people invented this in the 1970s. They said, oh, there are certain resins, and this is an echo of what we do, which bind uranium preferably, and we can just let pump seawater over these resins and we can get the uranium out. Worked like a charm, except nobody could pay for the pumping. And people say, well, we drag it behind a ship, and then we don't pay for the pumps, but the ship motor acts as a pump, right? Yeah. So that didn't work, and then some group in Japan some years ago said, why not make artificial kelp? We tie strands of this resin, which is buoyant, to the ocean floor and let the current do the job. They got several million times cheaper than what Sherwood would have predicted, right? And the reason is, they skipped the first step. And we are doing this very same thing for air capture. We have to be passive. And what got me going in this was the analogy to windmills. I said, well, the windmills are pulling kinetic energy out of the air. I am pulling CO2 out of the air. The windmills seem to work. 
what is the concentration of the, the, the kinetic energy in the air compared to the CO2? And I'm making a comparison by saying, well, if I did pull the CO2 out, I'm allowed to put it back in with generating energy, which puts that much CO2 out, and I use the heat of combustion. And I find that kinetic energy in the air takes six meters a second where you would put a windmill is 20 joules per cubic meter of air, whereas the CO2, which from gasoline would fill up one cubic meter of air with a natural amount of CO2, is, is uh, 10,000 uh, joules of, of energy equivalent. So in a way, the CO2 in the air is 500 times as more concentrated than the wind energy, yet we know how to do that. So the trick is you have to be passive in the first step. Then we looked at various options. David Keith is now still using calcium hydroxide or, or ultimately potassium hydroxide, which then is converted to calcium hydroxide, which then makes calcium carbonate, and you, you calcine that, so he goes up to 800 degrees C. We looked for other sorbents. There are other people who use amine swings, which are thermal. We honestly stumbled into a process that actually uses water to do the change. And it's an, an interesting chemistry. What happens is we have an anionic exchange resin, which when dry in the carbonate state has an enormous affinity for the CO2, binds that CO2, turns itself into a bicarbonate, and when we make it wet, the partial pressure of CO2 in equilibrium at any level of loading jumps up 500-fold over what it was when it was dry, and by dry I mean 20% relative humidity, and then we have a 500 times higher partial pressure simply by putting, exposing it either to 100% relative humidity or to expose it to liquid water. So this now is a swing where we can effectively go up to roughly 5% CO2 because as you, if I multiply by 500, 0.04 turns into 20%. Uh, but then I unload, and so a level we can hold in a dry climate is on the order of about 5% during the unloading process. So that, that back and forth then allows us to pump up CO2 to something which is akin to, to flue gas, except that it's very clean. And if I drop half of the CO2 back out by some secondary process, uh, I can now go back and, and reload that and do this over and over. We argue that in there is no energy, no significant energy consumption up to the point where we reached a few percent CO2. We are paying our bill, our energy bill, our free energy bill by evaporating water. In, in essence, the system at the end has a lower free energy state than before because the relative humidity of the air went up. Put another way, if you measure the air flowing through the, our filter, air filter passively, and you measure its temperature before and after, there's a one degree drop. And that is the source of the energy uh, which drove our system. Bottom line is, we think based on this, there are now several approaches. They all claim numbers which you really don't know until you really did it, on the order of $100 a ton. The APS study some years ago picked what I would argue a very brute force process. And if you actually look at the paper, by Mazzotti and all, they very clearly said, we are trying to build a process for air capture which uses nothing new, right? And if we build it out of existing technologies, then we can end up here in the APS process, so that's about $600 a ton. I would argue if you look at our process and look at the raw ingredients, resin material, water, electricity, heat, we add up to between $15 and $20 of of ingredients we can't help. Let me subtract that just to give you a feeling where I'm going from that $600 because that's sort of the irreducible cost at the end. I can't get rid of that. And then say we are at $600 a ton right now. We clearly have to get below 100 in order to be interesting. That's a factor six. There are plenty of people here who started to work on wind energy and, and photovoltaic energy long before they were within a factor six of parity with what fossil energy can do. I think we do have to allow that cost come down as we actually develop it. And I would argue this is a technology which has high risks. I'm the first one to admit we haven't proven that we can get to $50 or $30 a ton of CO2. But I also think nobody has proven the opposite. And its, it's value 
It's an extraordinary, people like to tell me there's an extraordinary claim that you can do it, therefore you shouldn't try. Right? And I say, well, you claiming that you are absolutely sure that can't be done is an extraordinary claim too. And the potential value of it in closing these cycles is enormous. And it's not just from a technology perspective, but also from a policy perspective. If you have this technology, you can tell everybody else to actually make it better. Air capture becomes the capture of last resort. I'm not arguing it goes into every niche and, and nook and does everything for you. But what I'm saying, if you say, I have no idea how to deal with my CO2, either because you really don't or because you don't want to deal with it, uh, you can say, well, you don't have to deal with it. You just pay for air capture. And you'd be surprised how fast those coal plants can solve their problem if you force them to deal with it this way. But I think its real importance is we can become that, that uh, create a circular carbon economy where we pull the CO2 back and give it to your cycle where we attach it to the hydrogen cycle. And I think we can get the price down if we are given the chance to do this. And these small startups, uh, David Keith's, uh, Peter Eisenberger's, have sort of shown that. I, on the other hand, want to do it in a university environment because somebody needs to kick the tires on it. Just look at Theranos what can happen if you just leave it to private companies. And I close on that. <laughs>